All right, so Genesis chapter number 20, of course, last week was that, that famous chapter on God raining fire and brimstone down on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and we went all throughout that. Now, before we get started in chapter 20, I just want to make one more point that I didn't make last week, and it's a small point, so don't worry, um, and this chapter is, is probably going to be a little bit shorter than the rest of them. But look at the end, because remember at the end, after God rained fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot fled with his two daughters and his wife, and his wife turned into a pillar of salt. He went to Zoar, but then he ended up fleeing from Zoar too because God overthrew Zoar and those neighboring cities as well. So he fled and went into a cave in the mountains, and his daughters thought like, Oh man, there's nobody left in the earth. We're the only ones left. And now if we don't, if we don't have children, then all of mankind is going to be destroyed. And that's what they were thinking. It was foolish. It was incorrect. It was not right. They committed a very wicked sin by getting their father drunk and, and taking advantage of him in that way so that they can be pregnant because they thought they were going to preserve seed. Okay, that was their plan, and that's what they did. And what I didn't go into last week, these, these children, Moab and Ammon, are the children that were born of those two daughters. And I just wanted to, to point out, if you don't know already, these are the children that, that became nations that are extremely wicked nations. And these were, were some of the nations that were cast out when, when Moses finally goes and they take that promised land, because this is way before, I mean, at the times of Abraham and Lot, this is generations and generations and generations prior to Moses leading Israel out of Egypt. And, you know, because they're in Egypt for like 400 years. I mean, they're there for a long time. And then going into the promised land. And when they go into that promised land, these people, the descendants of Ammon and Moab, have all, you know, been occupying this area. And they were extremely wicked. And the, when we read the sins in Leviticus and, and the laws that God was given, he's saying, you know, the people of the land, they did all these things. And they were very wicked in God's eyes. And that's what came of this in incest relationship. And I just wanted to make point. I, I didn't want to gloss over that too quickly because it was an extremely wicked thing. And as a result, there were these very wicked nations that were a result of that, that sin. And, um, you know, generally speaking, what you see is when you have a good, righteous father and, and family like Abraham, he says he's going to command his children to obey God and to keep his commandments. And God says, I know Abraham. I know that he's going to do God. I know he's going to direct his house to follow and serve the Lord. And when you see that happening, just like the kings of Israel and Judah, you know, you tend to have a lot more godly kings in Judah than in Israel because Israel is the, 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 the nation that that forsook the Lord and started making all their idols with um, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. That's when that started. That line of, of bad king kind of went down the wrong path, whereas the kings of Judah in general, they were the, the children of David, and David was a godly man, and they followed more in the way of righteousness. So it's very important the way that you live your life, not just for your sake, but for your family's sake, for your descendants' sake, and the things that you do you know, can have a long impact on future generations. Now, we all have free will, of course, but overall, and I'm not saying nobody from Moab or no one from Ammon got saved, but by and large, it was extremely wicked nations. That came as a result of this great sin. So, chapter 20 is where we're at tonight. And we see after those events, now Abraham decides to leave the land that he was living in, and he starts heading a little bit south. It says in verse 1, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country, and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, this isn't a new story. Excuse me. We saw this already in Genesis chapter 12. And I'm going to reference that a little bit further along in the sermon tonight. But Abraham has this pattern of, you know, being afraid that he's going to be killed for his wife's sake and, you know, because these people in these heathen lands are heathen, they have no respect for God or the Lord. So he's worried that they're going to kill him 
because his wife's beautiful and they want her to be their wife, so he just thinks that they're going to kill him. Now, it never seems to be the case that that would actually happen. He seems to have these fears that are kind of conjured up in his own mind. Now, I, I don't doubt that they're heathen people, you know, and that they don't know the Lord, but to the extent of what they're going to do, you know, is, is questionable. Now, regardless, that this doesn't justify his actions. I still think it's completely wrong what Abraham did in both of these situations, in Genesis 12 and in Genesis 20, where he lies and said, oh yeah, she's just my sister. And she even says, yeah, he's my brother. Because now look what happens. And, this is, and, and it kind of boggles my mind. He didn't learn this from, from the first time it happened. But he goes into the country and says, oh yeah, she's my sister. She says, he's my brother. So next thing that happens, now the king is saying, okay, well bring her to me. You know, he took, he took a liking to her. What is also kind of interesting about this, this takes place, you know, in Genesis 19, or in Genesis, yeah, in Genesis 18, rather, the angels that were on their way to Sodom stopped by, talked to Abraham, and they confirmed that Sarah was going to have a child. He said, according to this time next year, according to the time of life, I'm going to visit you. And, and that's when she was going to be with child with Isaac. Okay, when Isaac was born, Abraham's 100 years old. And Sarah was only like 10 years younger than him. So where we're at right now, Sarah is probably about 89 years old. And I think this is a little bit of a testimony to Sarah's beauty. I mean, what 89-year-old would you be worried about going into a, a, a foreign country or foreign land saying they're going to kill me for my wife's sake. Now, obviously, it's great that Abraham viewed her as such a beautiful woman, but he was, it wasn't just in his eyes that, that he thought of her in such a way because we see here the king is calling for this 89-year-old woman to come because he's looking to, to make her his wife. And that's, uh, that's a testimony to, to, the, to the beauty that God had endowed Sarah with. Because, I mean, at 89 years old, she's still, you know, he's still worried about this. And she's still getting the attention even of the king. Not even just some, you know, some random person. But, the, you know, the king has you know, essentially his choice probably of the, of the ladies of the land. And he sees this one. Oh, wow. You know, I want this. I want, I want this lady. Now, but we see where, where Abraham's lie is getting him. He's saying, oh, well, as soon as she says his sister, that's fair game, right? I mean, there's, there's no, nothing to say that, that you can't marry somebody's sister. That's, of course, that's just fine. So he sends, he takes Sarah, but we're also going to see how God deals with this. And, and what's really interesting here is the way that God looks over and takes care of Abraham. And I think that, you know, God looks after all of us. If you're born again, if you're saved, you're a child of God, God is your father. I think of how I look after my children because I love them, right? I'm not going to let anything bad happen to them. Someone's going to come and, and try to steal something away from them. I'm going to be there to try to protect them, right? And especially in this case, like it's his wife that belongs to Abraham. So God the Father is stepping in. But I think that Abraham gets even more special attention from God for a few different reasons. One of them is because he's a, he's a great man of faith. right? He, he's serving the Lord, he's doing what's right, and he's, he's, he's obeying God's commandments. Now, he, ab he obviously has some, some mistakes, and, but even through his mistakes, like this is a mistake, I don't think he should have lied to him. I, I think it was foolish of him to do that. But God is still there to protect him. So that, and we, we could take a little bit of comfort in that too. If we're doing what's right, you know, if we're, if we're, if we're generally doing what's right in the eyes of the Lord, we know that he's our father because we're, we're saved. If we make a mistake here and there, we can still know that God will still be looking out for us. We can still rely on God. He'll be our defense. He'll be our shield. He'll be looking out for us. And he can make sure that, that certain things won't happen to us. He can keep us safe and protected. But I also think that because Abraham was a prophet, that was another reason why God was looking out for him. It says in um, verse number 7, he says, now therefore, this, is, this was God speaking to Abimelech in a dream, now therefore restore the man his wife, 
Look at, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. So God makes it a point to tell Abimelech, hey, he's a prophet of the Lord. And I think these days, especially today, you know, we've lost such, um, so much respect for other people in general in our society, in our culture. We've gotten really relaxed. And, you know, good manners have gone out the window. Politeness, courtesy have all gone out the window. People don't show proper respect unto others anymore. You know, we used to be a land where people would respect their elders and speak to them with respect and not with disdain and not talk down to people that are your elder and, and use words like sir and ma'am and, and not just throw around first names all the time. Even, you know, when, when, when you first meet somebody, it would be like Mr. Anderson or Mr. You know, and, and, and speaking to someone on that type of a basis used to be the norm. And I think that's great. I think we ought to have that level of respect for people. And even if the world around us doesn't do it, we as independent fundamental Baptists ought to have this type of a culture where we still will show respect unto people. And one of the areas where I think, especially with the age of the internet, where people don't have respect anymore is for pastors. People look down on pastors and they'll be throwing all kinds of accusations out there and saying, oh, this guy, you know, just, just ever at the drop of a hat, this guy's a heretic. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Man, this guy's a fool. This guy's stupid. And they're talking about, and, and in some cases, you know, when you're talking about a false prophet, when you're talking about a Joel Osteen or something, that's just, that's just, you know, basically blaspheming the word of the Lord and is just in it for the money and he's a false teacher, Fine. But too many people are doing it with, with people who are men of God, with people who God has ordained and does want in the ministry and is doing a good work and is going out and getting souls saved. And too many people, and it's, and it's, it's among, often among the younger generation, they think they know so much because they hear some good preaching, they hear some sermons, and they say, oh man, this church that I've been going to, they're so watered down and they don't know anything and they're not doing what's right. And you know what? Maybe that's true. But they get themselves lifted up in pride to where they think they know so much. And I see this, I've seen this so many times, especially with people who maybe have, have gotten turned on to, to specific preachers for maybe three months or six months, and now all of a sudden they think they know everything. They still haven't even read the Bible from cover to cover on their own, yet they just know, oh, they're so smart. Oh, yeah, these, these preachers that are preaching this, the, the, the pre-trib rapture, I can't believe they're so stupid, I know more than them. And they get this haughty, puffed up attitude, which is wicked. And they become very disrespectful towards men of God that are doing a good work for God. Now look, I disagree with plenty of, of, of other men of God that are saved, that are doing good works for God on different doctrines. Especially the pre-trib rapture one. Okay, look, that's going to, you know, a lot of people believe in that. But I'm not going to say... These guys are idiots. They're so stupid. I can't believe what, the, you know, like, and just, just have no respect for them. Because look, just because someone disagrees with you, you could maybe they'll see something plain as day and they don't see it. It doesn't make them stupid or an idiot. Because everything that you know, you've learned from someone else or from the Bible. From, you know, like you've, you've had to learn these things. There was a time when you didn't know it. Okay, so just because someone else is, is unaware of something or maybe they can't comprehend it or they don't get it or they just simply get it but they don't believe it. They say, you know what? No, I think that this is true. It doesn't make them an idiot. It doesn't mean you should just go around and start you know, disrespecting those people that are actually men of God that are actually doing good things. And there's too much of a lack of respect in today's society and we ought to be able to, to deal with people courteously and, and appropriately and when you see the way that God takes care of his prophets, I mean, you think of the perfect example is King David, right? Saul was anointed by God to be the king of Israel. And David had so much respect for that, that, that Saul was anointed to be king, that he did not, he said, God forbid I should lift up my hand against God's anointed. Even when he had the perfect opportunities and even when Saul was after David's life, he had respect 
for God's ordaining of that of him to be king. And he said, you know what? I'm going to let God deal with this. And he was not cursing Saul and saying all these bad things about Saul or to Saul. He was, okay, you know, like trying to make peace with him. And even though David, you could say, might have been justified since Paul, you know, Saul was after his life, he didn't do it. And you see God's protection over those that are, that are his anointed. And we ought to make sure that we're not being combative or even not showing the proper respect to people who God has ordained to be in certain positions. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying this because I feel like I have to, like I feel like I'm so lifted up with pride in my position and you all need to bow down and respect. No, it's not like that at all. And the people that are in this church, I have no problems with and treat me just fine. And hopefully they feel like I treat them just fine as well. But, but it's not an issue here. I'm just saying in general in our society, there's too, many, too much of this going on where people aren't showing the proper respect where it's due. And people ought to have a better, more of a fear of God when we see, and we're gonna, that's why I'm bringing this up, we're going to see in this chapter how God really takes care of his people and especially those that are anointed to be a prophet or, or something like that. God takes special interest in them and special protection. So look at what we see in verse number three. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. So God's ready to kill Abimelech. Thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, we truly have nothing to worry about when God is our defense. He's our father looking out for us. Let's jump to verse number five. Excuse me. He says, Said he not unto me, she is my sister. So well, let's keep reading verse four. But Abimelech had not come near her. So at this point, God says, look, you're, you're a dead man. You've got, you know, that woman that you have, that's another man's wife. So Abimelech responds. He says, you know, Abimelech hadn't come near her though. So he hadn't done, he hadn't touched her yet. He hadn't done anything. And he said, Lord, wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister, and she even she herself said he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands have I done this. So he's saying, look, I didn't, you know, I didn't even know. She said that, you know, he said that she's my sister, and then she even told me herself, like, like yes, she confirmed it. He's my brother. Lord, you know, like, like, don't kill me. I didn't know. Is in the integrity of my heart. If I would have known that, I could see. But I, but I didn't know that. And look what it says in verse number 6. And God said unto him in a dream, Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart, for I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Now, there's a couple points I want to make out of this. The first one I want to point out is that God speaking to um, Abimelech in a dream. Right? We see that twice in verse 3 and also in verse 6. It says, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night. And this is how God has dealt with people in the past. But Abraham was different and Moses was different. I'll read from you from Numbers chapter 12. Uh, verse number 6 says, And he said, Hear now my words. And this is when the people were coming against Moses. There is a murmuring against Moses, and which happened from time to time. And and he said, Hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. So he's saying this is how God has dealt with the prophets in general and in the past especially. Um, you know, he'd come to them in a dream. He says in verse 7, My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and, in, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And this, again, this ties in perfectly with what we're looking at here because Abraham was the same exact way. We saw in chapter 18 when the angels came, it wasn't just the angels, the Lord spoke unto Abraham. And he spoke unto him like face to face, right? Because Abraham was considered God's friend. And he had, um, he loved Abraham enough because Abraham followed him. He was like, I mean, Abraham and Moses are very similar in this regard. God's making a point talking to these people who came against Moses saying, look, normally 
When I deal with a prophet, when I want someone to know my words, when I want someone to, to prophesy what, what I have to say, I'll come to them in a dream. But it's not like that with Moses. With Moses, he's like speaking to me face to face. It's mouth to mouth is what he says. And you know it was the same way with Abraham. God didn't just come to Abraham in a dream. God actually came to him and, and directly communicated and spoke with him to the point where Abraham saying, you know, Lord, well, if there's, you know, if there's 20, will you destroy it for 20? And, and he's having a conversation with him. That is how much God appreciated the, the fact that, that Abraham, you know, was doing what's right and loved him and he considered him more like a friend. And um, God is rebuking these people he says, you know, in, in that passage I read from Numbers, he says, Wherefore then were ye not afraid? Because I speak with Moses face to face, because I do this. Why didn't you fear? Why wouldn't you fear to come against my servant Moses? This is the special defense that, that God provides for people that he really is is um, happy that they're doing his will. You know, people that that are that are following him very well, like a Moses, like an Abraham. He gives them special protection and special privilege, if you will. He's saying, "Look, and you all ought to know this because he's my servant and I, and he's my friend, and I'm speaking to him like this. You ought to be afraid to come at me with some grievances and complaints against Moses because he's my friend." And this is the way that God's dealing with Abraham as well. And, and we need to keep that in mind. When you have a, a man of God that's, that's walking that close to God, you ought to be afraid to, to, <laughs> to say something against that man of God. Honestly, we all ought to have that, that type of a fear. We see that in Numbers 12, and we see the same thing here because he's, he's threatening to kill Abimelech. Because even, even though God knows that he didn't know that they were married. He's still saying, you're a dead man. You're going to die. And <laughs> like, like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, I didn't even know this. But the other thing I want to point out as well. So in Genesis 20, look at verse number 6. At the very end of that verse, he says, Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. So God made it so that Abimelech wouldn't commit that sin with Sarah. He actually made it so that he didn't allow Abimelech to do that, that sin. He, he, he protected Sarah and Abraham from that even happening, which is amazing in itself. Because we know that God has given us free will and we can do certain things, but God also can put up a hedge of protection around us. And again, even when we make mistakes, Abraham, I believe, made a mistake in, in, in lying here and saying that he's your sister. But God still made sure that she was protecting that that didn't happen. And he says, you know, I made I made sure that this didn't happen, but I'm telling you right now, you better you better give her back, you know. And um, I think that's kind of neat too that God didn't suffer her suffer him to touch her. He's like I didn't allow it. Okay? And God can work in ways where we don't even always realize it. In this case, it could have just been some, some random string of circumstances that, that would keep Abimelech busy doing other things or whatever, some other things coming up and gra grabbing his attention could be attributed to God making those things come up so that this scenario couldn't play out the way that maybe Abimelech wanted it to for her to become his wife. But um, God, nonetheless, however he did it, he made sure that this didn't happen. So, um, let's keep reading here. Verse number seven. He says, Now therefore restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Now, I think it's also interesting here that, that God leaves it up to Abraham then to pray for Abimelech. God steps in and he, and he, and he makes the promise and look, if you don't give her back, she's going to die. But then he's, he's leaving it up for Abraham to have to pray for Abimelech. And he says, okay, and then he's going to pray for you. So basically, you know, if you don't do right by Abraham, you better make, he's basically telling him, like, you better make sure that Abraham's going to pray for you too. You know, that, that, that you, and when we see what happens because 
Abraham receives a lot of stuff from Abimelech, and he gives him some money, and he gives him some animals, and all this stuff. Like, like he's he's afraid, I, and for good reason. You know, God came to him saying, like, you're gonna die. So he's like, okay. He's like, Abraham, you need to pray for me. Here, you know, here's some stuff. Here, you know, and he ends up blessing Abraham, and um, and it works out for him, obviously, because God doesn't kill him. So let's keep reading. Here. Verse number eight says, therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears. And the men were sore afraid. He tells everyone, look, man, this is what happened. And they were, they were all started to be afraid of the Lord. Verse number 9 says, Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. Now, I can definitely see where Abimelech is coming from here. I can I could understand, like, why would you do this to me? You know, like, like, God's threatening to kill me. And I didn't even know. Like, I, I didn't even know I was doing anything wrong. I didn't know I was doing anything bad. And it's because you lied to me. Like, look at what you've done to me. Why did you do this to me? Now, I can see where he's coming from, but still only to a point. And the reason why is because I don't, Abimelech's not that innocent either. Now, he didn't know that they were married. But look what the Bible says in, chap in verse 17 of this chapter. It says, So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bear children. Abimelech was already married. What is he doing looking after other women still when he already has his own wife? And even though people practice polygamy in the Bible, it was never okay. It was never justified. It was never righteous for people to practice polygamy. God made man, male and female, created he them. And, you know, and for, it was for this cause that man should leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. Not three, not four, not five becoming one flesh. Two became one flesh. You leave your parents to go and cleave to your wife and you start a new family together. You don't leave your, your father and your mother and your other mother and your other mother. <laughs> you leave your father and mother and you cleave to your wife and that's the way that God's plan has always been. Just because people in the, in the past have had multiple wives does not make it okay. They did it, yes, it's a true and that's why it's in the Bible because they did it. But it doesn't make it right and that's never been God's plan. So Abimelech here we see, like I said, I can, I can understand what he's saying about what Abraham did. But at the same point, he's not guiltless either because what's he doing looking for another wife? He already has one. He should have been satisfied with his wife and not looking at other people's and he wouldn't have gotten himself into this trouble. It's like people are liking it like this because this is a much more likely situation to happen to these days. You have a, a young single man, right? And what he ought to do is keep himself pure until the day he gets married. But maybe you'll have a man get involved in a situation with a woman where he doesn't know that she's married and she's an adulteress and she's going out to commit adultery. What's going to happen then if, if, you know, if he gets caught? He can say, whoa, I didn't know that she was married to you. Yeah, but you shouldn't have been going out and doing that thing either. So if the husband comes home and kills you because you're committing fornication, you're committing adultery with his wife, it doesn't matter. He's not going to care if you say, oh, I didn't know she was married. You're going to be dead either way right? in most situations. Those are going to catch you say, he's probably going to kill you. Okay? And I don't have sympathy for that person, even though they say, oh, well, I didn't know. I did it ignorant. You know, in the integrity of my heart, I was taking No. You have no integrity if you're going to commit fornication anyways. You need to keep yourself pure. So that those are the type of situations you could get yourself in without even realizing it when you're getting in other sins. And we need to make sure that we, that we you know, keep ourselves from, from all sin and that we could, we could keep ourselves pure. And then we won't find ourselves in these other situations. Bimlech wouldn't have found himself in this situation if he would have just stayed with his wife, if he wasn't looking at other wives. But now here he is, ready to be killed by God. And then... Um, but we see how quickly things can get out of hand. You know, one little lie. So Abraham's thinking, you know what? You know, I'm afraid, I, I, you know, if they just think she's my sister, then they won't kill me. But Abraham, think about what's the next step. If they want your wife that bad that they'd be willing to kill you, then what's going to happen? 
What do you think is going to happen if you tell them they're your, your, your sister and brother? Someone's going to come and want your wife to be their wife. And is that really better? You know, I mean, I, I, would, I, did he really think about that? I don't think he thought it all the way through. Because now he's got to be in this land, in this foreign land, by himself, while his wife is just, you know, in this case, she'd be the wife of the king. And what's he going to do about it now? He's just going to have to live with that, knowing that she is just now some other man's wife. And it's all a result of his sin, of his telling that lie. And things just got way out of control. Whereas, if he would have just told the truth, he could say, you know what? I'm just going to rely on God to protect me. If they want to try to kill me for my wife, hey, maybe God will protect me. Or actually, I trust that God will protect me, but I'm not going to allow a situation to come up to where someone's going to think that we're not married and then take her to be their wife. Because he got himself into this situation. I mean, thankfully, God you know, cares about him and is, is a good father and he still stepped in and protected him and everything else. And, and it's great to have that assurance. But we ought not to be putting ourselves in those situations either. And... What's, what I mentioned this earlier, you know, I find really interesting about the story is that it's not the first time that this even happened. You'd think he would learn after the first time he did this because he's been through this. I'll read for you quickly from Genesis chapter 12 when he goes into Egypt. In verse 17, it says, And the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that thou hast done unto me? It sounds similar, right? I mean, it's exactly what Bimlech said. What are you doing to me? Like, like, why? What in the world? Why aren't you telling me that she's your wife? What you know? What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to me to wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife. Take her and go thy way. So he ascends her out. But he's done this before, and. Um, It's too bad they didn't learn his lesson because it's, it was the same, the same scenario popped up the second time. And, and I believe, and, and you, know, you can't go back in history and say what would have been, but I don't think that either of those situations would have been a problem. We see how much God's protecting him anyways. God wouldn't have allowed Abraham to die because they wanted Sarah to be their wife. They probably would have just been like, oh, they're married. And that's it. Instead of you know, creating all of this drama and all this problems because you've told a lie. And when we, you know, oftentimes we think, oh, telling a lie is not that big of a deal. Just one little lie. Well, I wonder how many lies had to be continued to be told to keep up this story of them being brother and sister. Because we see Abimelech, he talked to Abram and he talked to Sarah. He says, Sarah even told me herself. Now, if he took her unto him, I don't know how long she was staying with him in the, you know, in the castle or whatever, they had to have had some kind of conversation. How do you explain, oh yeah, we're, we were over here, we were doing this, and it's like, this whole time your brother and sister? You know, like, your stories, you're gonna, you have to add lies in order to maintain that original lie. And that's always the way it is when you start to tell lies. You have to continue to tell more and more and more lies just to, to not make it known what you, um, what you originally relied about. And you end up making your situation way worse than it needs to be. So we need to, to keep ourselves and refrain from, from trying to have a lie protect us or save us. Look at verse number 10. It says, And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? So he's saying, What did you even see? Like, why, why did you tell me that she's your sister? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will slay me for my wife's sake. And yet, indeed, she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, This is the kindness which thou shalt show unto me at every place whither we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. And um, so he says here, you know, it's not really a lie. It's just not the full truth. It's basically what he's saying. is like, she is my sister. Now, we don't have a biblical record of Sarah's genealogy. So we don't know for sure, for a fact, that, that Abraham is telling the truth here. I mean, he's already lied. So we don't know for sure. And, and, and I'm kind of on the fence on whether or not I believe Abraham's story that she is his half-sister. I kind of tend to believe that she is, that she was, that what he said there was true. But 
it's kind of hard. We don't we don't have evidence. We don't have enough scriptural evidence to say yes, he was telling the truth because the Bible records things that are said, but just because it was said doesn't make it true, right? Just like when Mary said unto Jesus, you know, behold, thy, thy father and and I have have sought thee, you know, like in in Luke chapter two, she calls Joseph Jesus his father, but that's not really true. Because the Holy Ghost, the, the, the narrator of the Bible, you know, never references Joseph as Jesus' father. Because he's not. Because God is Jesus' father. So the fact that Mary said that is true because those are the words that came out of her mouth. The same way that this is what Abraham said. But the content of what was said, is that true? You know, in Mary's case, no, it wasn't. In Abraham's case, we don't know. But um, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. But he's trying to justify saying, you know what, she is my sister. You know, obviously she was his wife too and he didn't reveal that. But he's trying to kind of justify and play it down. He's like, well, you know, she is my sister. But, um, you know, and, and he's just, he's, he's playing it down that way. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 14. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah, his wife. So remember I was talking about God, you know, God saying Abraham's going to need to pray for you. And, and, and you're a dead man. So he's like, he gives them sheep. He gives them oxen. He even gives them servants, like people to help take care of all this stuff. He's like, I'm going to give you men servants, women servants. And he gave all of that unto Abraham. He's like, here you go. Like, take your wife and take all of this stuff. He got scared by the Lord, which, which he ought to. You know, he ought to have had that, that proper fear. And he restored him Sarah's wife. And Abimelech said, behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleases. He said, you know what? The whole land's open. Anywhere that you want to, to go, go ahead, sit up. Anywhere you want to go is fine with me. And then look at verse 16. It says, And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other. Thus she was reproved. This is kind of interesting uh, that the way that Abimelech speaks in unto Sarah because he's, like it says here, thus she was reproved. So what Abimelech is saying to her He's, he's rebuking her. He's reproving her. Basically saying, you know, in, in his words, he was, he was criticizing her and saying that she was wrong for doing what she did. Um, but he said, he says, behold, I have given thy brother. So he doesn't call him her husband. I haven't given your husband. He says, I've given your brother. And just kind of repeating that lie back to her. Say, look, okay, look now, Sarah. I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. And says, Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes and to all that are with thee. So he's saying that, you know, he's, um, he's your covering. And again, I think about the number of lies she must have told to continue that story. And um, even though Abraham feared for his life, you would think that, that when it came to this point to where she's going actually into to Abimelech where he wants to marry her, that she would say, you know what, no, we, you know, like, like I'm married already and, and should have said something at that point, but she didn't. And that's, and that's where Abimelech here is reproving her for not doing so. Well, let's keep reading here. We're almost done. Verse 17. So Abraham prayed unto God and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants and they bear children. For the Lord had fast closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Now, I already went over this in Genesis chapter 12, how God is the one that's responsible for opening and closing the womb. And he's the one that, that you know, allows for this to happen. And, and people today want to take matters into their own hands and play God. And, and, but what, the point I want to cover tonight with this is that we see here a God's curse upon Abimelech because he was cursing him by, by having Sarah in his house to take her to wife. So God immediately started cursing him. And the curse that God had was that Abimelech in his house was not going to have children. And we live in such a backward society that oftentimes there's a lot of people today that think having children is a curse. They think that like, oh, if I sleep wrong, if I, oh man, I don't want to have children. Oh, I'm not ready for children yet. I don't want to have any children. I want to do the act, but I don't want to have any children out of it. They think that that would be like a curse unto them to have children. Whereas God's curse is not having children. It's not having children. People will look today at large families and be like, oh man, you know, they can't, you know, I feel sorry for you. 
They look at someone who has eight, nine, ten children, like, oh man, I don't know how you can do it. I feel sorry for you. Like, don't, don't feel sorry for that person. You should be glad for that person because God has blessed that person. God has blessed that family with lots of children because children are an heritage of the Lord. Children are a blessing. And we've got a backward society that thinks, you know, you should have two children, three children. That's enough. Don't have any more than that. As if, you know, because they're so, they cost so much money and they're so hard to deal with and you have to raise them. You have to do all this other stuff. Is it a lot of work? Yes. But you know what? Children are a blessing from the Lord. A blessing. God's curse is not having children. I am so thankful to God that we've got our fourth on the way, and I pray that God continues to bless us with more children. I will have as many as God gives us because I know that they're a blessing. I love every single one of these children, and, and I can't imagine my life without them. And um, and. We need to, to get back into understanding this biblical truth of how much a blessing children are and that we shouldn't disdain them or disdain these families. Oh man, when are they ever going to quit? You know what? Hopefully never. That God will just continue to bless, them, bless us with children because they are a blessing. Get in your Bible, Christian, and understand that, that this is the curse that God has given. Not having children is a curse which means having children. And there's plenty of other verses that explain the blessings of having children. But um, that's the biblical view. Now one last thing I want to point out here is, because um, we're pretty much done with this chapter. is how the sins of the parents, and this is why we, we have to be very careful, especially as parents, with the way you live your life. Because all, all sin that you do, first of all, it doesn't just impact you. It impacts other people around you. Okay, there's always someone else that suffers as a result. Now, the, in, in Abraham's case here, when he sinned by, by lying about Sarah being his wife, Abimelech suffered for that, right? He was going to be killed in his whole house. They, you know, God closed up the wombs and everything else. But when you sin, it's never just about you. I don't care what the sin is. It's never just about you. It's going to impact other people. You're always hurting other people when you sin. But as parents especially, we, we see a pattern. And there's a few examples in the Bible where you'll see the, the dad do it, committing a certain sin. And then the children do that sin even more, and they take it even farther than, than the parent does, which is all the more reason we have to be very careful with the things that we do and, and, and be careful to live a very righteous, holy life that's, that's as free from sin as possible because oftentimes those sins will pass on to our children and they'll take them even further than we took them. And we, what I'm talking about here, one example is right here from this book in Genesis where Abraham is lying about his wife. It doesn't stop with Abraham. Isaac ends up doing the same exact thing. If you want to flip ahead to chapter 26 of Genesis, we'll just see where this story happens. We're going to get there in six weeks, but in, in, uh, I'm not going to go over it that much then. But it's, it's interesting too because it's with the same king even, with Abimelech. Remember, Abimelech wanted, wanted Sarah to be his wife? Well, Abimelech wants Rebekah to be his wife also. And Isaac lies about her and says that she's his sister as well. So in verse number 7 of chapter 26, the Bible says, And the men of the place asked him of his wife. And he said, She is my sister. Same thing that Abraham said. For he feared to say, She is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah because she was fair to look upon. And it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety she is thy wife. And how saidst thou she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, lest I die for her. Now, in... in <laughs> there's a... Uh, I, I just went over this on Sunday, but there's a problem right there. Why is he not willing to die for his wife? That's the love, that, according to Ephesians chapter 5, that the husband ought to have for their wife. Because the, the Bible says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. The way that Christ gave up his own life and his sacrifice for the church, that's the way that we ought to love our wives. Unto death. 
to where we're not going to be scared about it and say, no, I'm willing to die for my wife. Say, instead of saying, well, lest I die, I don't want to die for her. You ought to be ready to die for your wife if you love her. But look at verse 10. And he says, And Abimelech said, What is this thou hast done unto us? One of the people might have lightly have lied with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. So Abimelech makes it right. I mean, he was still probably afraid from, from his encounter with Abraham. Right? He remembers that. And he's saying, You know what? Nobody touches Isaac or Rebekah, or else you're going to be put to death. He's saying, you leave them alone. But um, what you'll notice with this example is that, you know, in Abraham's case, he had some form of justification for his lie. He says, well, you know, she really is my half-sister because we have the same dad, just different moms. But we know for a fact that that's not the case with Isaac and Rebekah. He said that Rebecca was his sister, and that was just a flat-out lie. There's no question about it. Because we know who Rebecca was born of, and we know who Isaac was born of, and we know that they are not half-sisters, or you know, half-brother and sister. They're not half-siblings at all. That they, are, they were not siblings in, in any way, shape, or form. So he's taken that sin even further. You know, he repeated his father's sin, but in a way you could say it's even worse because there is no truth in it at all. If what Abraham said was true, this one had no truth, but he continued down that path. But another example we see from the Bible of a father and a son committing sin, you know that David had multiple wives. David has at least, had at least eight wives. I, you know, I didn't do a really thorough study to count every single last one of his wives. I just went to a couple places where I know it listed off his wives, and I counted at least eight. He had Michal, he had um, uh, Abigail, uh, Ahinoam, he had Bathsheba, and then um, that's four, and then there was what? Maica, Haggith, Abidal, and Egla. At least. So there's at least eight wives. They had eight wives. But what did his son do? Solomon. Solomon said, well, hey, if it's okay for dad to have multiple wives, right? Well, then what's the difference between eight and 700? <laughs> Seriously. Because well, when you get to that point, where are you going to draw the line? When is sinning sinning too much? When you say, well, if it's okay for dad to have two wives or eight wives or whatever, well, I'm going to have even more. Because why not? And this is the message that you're sending to your children. When, when you partake in a certain sin and, and you are doing these sins and you say, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal. Well, if it's not that big of a deal, your children are going to see that and say, oh, okay, well, this must be okay then because mom is doing this or dad is doing this. Even though you're trying to minimize how much you're sinning, they're going to see that and say, oh, well, it must be just fine. See, you know it's not right, but you're trying to keep it down to a minimum. They see that and say, oh, well, they're doing it. It must be fine. And they'll take that to the extreme and just run with it and go with it, which is why we need to be very careful. And that's exactly what Solomon did. I mean, it's 700 wives and 300 concubines, which, hey, I mean, if it's, if it's okay to have two, it's okay to have 700. But it's not okay to have two, and it's not okay to have 700. It's not okay to have any more than one. And we need to, to, to keep that type of an attitude in our life, especially around children, especially with children. Because look, and even if you're not their parent, now look, I think it's very critical for the parents. But you don't know what children might be looking up to you. Children always find someone that they like, that they, that they want to be like, that they, they take a liking to. Especially in church, you know, children, you know, they'll, they'll get to know people and be like, you know what, they really like whoever. And if that person is you, they're going to be looking at you really closely when you don't even realize it. So be careful about the things that you say and the things that you do and the way that you present yourself and, and you know, try to keep yourself to a high standard even for their sakes. Right? And especially if you're a parent for your children's sakes. Be diligent not to just be an open sin so that they can pick up on that because they're going to run with that. They look at the things that you do and they'll mimic you and they'll, and they'll try to do the same things because they look up to you. And if they, if they see you doing it, they, must, they think that must be just fine. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much 
for your words. We thank you for the Bible, dear God. We thank you for these, these stories that we see here and um, for all the wisdom and the knowledge that we get to learn. God, I pray that you would please help us to continue to learn, continue to grow, and stay steadfast in our faith, dear Lord. We, we rejoice in the fact that you are our Father and that you will look out for us and protect us. And it really is comforting to know that we have someone that, that will protect us and help us to, to be bold in that regard and knowing that you'll protect us that we don't feel like we have to do something sinful or do something like tell a lie to, to get us out of trouble, but we can completely trust and rest in you that you will protect us. You know, we just you need to keep doing the things that are pleasing in your sight. Um, and, and we'll try to do that the best of our ability. And it'll be a lot easier to do those things knowing that you'll protect us, dear Lord, and you're totally capable of doing so. Help us to have more respect for other people, dear Lord, and to, and to use proper manners and courtesy when we deal with people, especially people who have been appointed by you, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.